Blatman and Miguel point to something interesting in the conflict literature, uh, something that we briefly mentioned last week, but I wanted to spend a bit more time on now, namely that uh, there are two main levels of analysis in the conflict literature, that at the state or group level um, and at the individual level. Um, Collier and Hoffler, Miguel et al. both focus on the state level uh, in their empirical models, although Collier and Hoffler do outline uh, an individual level kind of rational choice cost benefit analysis um, in their uh, greed approach. But uh, I mean, while we often do think of countries as um, unitary rational actors um, in a lot of international relations and conflict theory, um, uh, rather than their um, constituent um, uh, elements, right, states or provinces, especially in countries that we're less uh, familiar with. Um, I mean, it also depends on the area in which you're actually looking at uh, the type of area. In, in areas of um, national security, for example, uh, when we speak about Australia's interests in the Asia Pacific, we rarely differentiate between uh, different parts of uh, Australia um, or different types of individuals because there's an assumption that everyone in this country can at least share the basic um, uh, national interest in being able to defend uh, our sovereignty uh, and pursue our national interest uh, abroad. However, um, when we speak about interests related to other topics, maybe the Australian mining sector or um, live animal exports, there's more likely to be um, a difference of opinion and uh, there's less of an assumption that everyone shares the same uh, view um, um, across states and territories and different types of individuals. Um, or, I mean, you think of an example um, from the United States, there's probably less, um, ish, uh, less of a challenge talking about the U.S. national interest um, in its um, uh, reactions to Iran uh, than there would be in uh, migration uh, policy with Mexico and Central America, right? In certain areas, the state level of analysis makes sense. In certain areas, maybe less so. Um, so I guess this is a long-winded way of me to kind of introduce the third and last um, reading for today, that of Buhaug uh, et al., 2011. Their main argument, their main argument um, is uh, largely uh, building on the existing literature um, that assumes that the relationship between GDP and conflict is an aggregate one at the state level and that um, uh, as GDP goes up at the national level, the national level um, likelihood of conflict is is going to go down. Um, their insight is that income varies um, within states as well as the likelihood of conflict within it due to the ways that incomes uh, levels affects people's behavior and likelihood uh, to use um, uh, to use violence. Their argument is is twofold, looking at two different aspects of the relationship between economic factors and conflict. First is an absolute um, uh, relationship that conflict is more likely to break out in areas with low absolute income. Um, and the second one is a relative um, uh, marker in which you have as um, national uh, income within an area um, changes uh, that also will increase um, the the likelihood of conflict to break out both positively and negatively uh, in areas that are particularly uh, well off um, compared to the national average and those that are, are less off as they as they change um, they're more likely to have conflict their main example is um, India and you can see here from the figure, the unit of analysis is quite small. It's those um, grids, um, those small squares in the left figure. Um, and you can see how much, both within the grids themselves as well as at the province level, how much variation there is in national income within the state. And I think their argument is quite intuitive, right? That um, uh, from my experience uh, with the country, there's likely to be a much 
different likelihood of conflict in areas um, like Kerala or Bangalore than there would be um, to be in uh, Assam or Nagaland, right? Um, there are a, a lot of different cases of uh, regional differentiation. Some of them might be connected to ethnic differences, but others might have absolutely nothing to do with it. It might have to do with uh, economic uh, motivations, right? And this is uh, one way to kind of look at regional inequality. Um, and they, they come up with a, a state uh, per capita uh, measure and then extrapolate it to the, um, to the uh, grid cell level. They're using other people's data, the GECON data, to do that. Um, there are some limitations to those data, which we're going to get to in a second. But I thought I would highlight a couple of other different ways that people have started to look at subnational development and conflict that could be of interest to you. Um, and you can play around with the data. The first one would be the PRIO grid data set. Um, PRIO is a Peace Research Institute Oslo that does a lot of cutting edge research related to peace science. They have the Journal of Peace Research Journal based there and um, Scandinavia with uh, Uppsala um, University also having the UCDP data. They've, um, they've gathered their own data um, initially in partnership with UCDP, but they gradually took over with it. But what PRIO has done is they've aggregated a lot of different data sets. They have the data set on, um, on um, conflict, as I mentioned before, but they've also been at the forefront of trying to push subnational studies of conflict. And you can see from this map, um, one of the one of their more popular measures of uh, or proxies for economic activity that is um, the amount of uh, light emanating from a particular part of the country uh, at night um, that there has there have been some studies that suggest that areas that are more economically busy and populated are more likely to have um, more light um, coming from at night that you can see with the satellite. This is a global uh, level. You can see um, the eastern part of the United States, uh, Europe, um, South Asia, uh, and uh, East Asia are quite uh, dense in blue. Um, but you can also look at some quite dramatic differences. The most obvious one that I could see um, would that be the, uh, the difference in nightlights across the 38th parallel between South and North Korea. Um, the North Korean um, part of the peninsula is pretty much dark at night, except for a few um, lights clustered around Pyongyang and a few other um, civilization areas. But I think it's most a dramatic example of areas in which you have uh, dramatic economic activity in South Korea, Japan, and, and China, and in North Korea. And this is a way to kind of also bring home the differences that you can measure over time. Um, this study in The Economist suggests that nightlights have decreased in North Korea from 2013 to 2015 as an indicator of um, economic uh, lack of economic growth. Um, but uh, it could also be used as a, a cross-country uh, comparison of inequality as well. And that leads me to this, I think, really kind of remarkable trend in the difference between the relative inequality and absolute inequality um, and how that has shifted uh, since 2000 uh, over time. Um, and I think it's important both theoretically and empirically to differentiate uh, between these several different kinds of inequality. First, um, relative and absolute. This, uh, this graph is from uh, the journal The Review of Income and Wealth which finds that relative inequality is declining worldwide while absolute inequality is growing. And just to be able to be clear about what the difference between relative and absolute inequality is, um, in an interview, one of the authors um, described it, I think, better than I could. Namely, that the t uh, take the case of two people in Vietnam in 1986. One person had uh, an income of U.S. $1 per day, and the other person had an income of $10 a day. With the kind of in income growth that Vietnam, Vietnam has seen over the last 30 years, um, the first person would now have $8 a day, while the second person would have $80 a day. So we focus on absolute uh, differences. The difference, um, the gap between those two people, that was $9 um, initially, one to 10, now it's eight to 80, um, there's a, um, 72 
uh, dollars difference. That absolute amount, 72, is much larger uh, than the $9 it was initially, uh, but relatively, um, the difference would have uh, remained the same, right? So if you focus on relative differences, um, the percentage would be the same, um, but the absolute is different, and that has implications both for people's livelihoods and the, their ability to, uh, to thrive and continue, uh, contribute to the economy. And second of all, with the likelihood of uh, grievances uh, being formed or um, people's cost-benefit analysis um, changing in their willingness to be able to, uh, to uh, want to change the government in which they live. One, um, and I think this has important implications for the conflict literature, right? If you focus on uh, whether it's relative or um, uh, absolute deprivation. Um, Dave Mason has a really interesting book that talks more about that. So that's relative versus absolute. Another way to conceptualize inequality would be horizontal versus um, uh, vertical inequality. This uh, snapshot of a neighborhood in Mexico City, uh, an area of quite high inequality, is one in which um, yeah, I think it's clear to kind of visualize the, the structural differences between um, a lot of different people. Uh, vertical inequality, uh, a quote again from, from others who've, uh, who've worked in this area, um, Stuart Brown and Cobham. Uh, vertical inequality consists of inequality across individuals or households. Um, while horizontal inequality is defined as inequality across groups, typically culturally defined by ethnicity, religion, or race. Um, Buhag et al. finds more evidence for horizontal inequality. So uh, vertical inequality would be um, me comparing myself to Bill Gates or Elon Musk or whatever, um, and horizontal, horizontal inequality would be comparing myself to, to someone in a different ethnic, religious, or linguistic group um, that is uh, doing um, better off, not necessarily at an individual level, but as a, maybe as a, as a group level. Um, there's one in recent example that I found quite dramatic when I, was, I came across it in the headlines that you can interpret it in a couple of different ways, and unless you knew more about the context, you might have different opinions about whether this is a case of horizontal or vertical inequality, and that was back a couple years ago in which um, uh, the police broke into a, a high-rise uh, apartment building uh, in Nigeria and found in various um, filing cabinets um, and duffel bags $43, US, uh, 43 million dollars in, in US dollars in cash. Uh, it wasn't clear exactly whose it was initially uh, over the course of t uh, time. And you can see in this um, press clipping from back in 2017, um, there was a gradual understanding that it was um, owned uh, or it was um, operated by the head of the National uh, Intelligence Service uh, within Nigeria. And um, there was claims that this money was for legitimate purposes in order to pay sources and to be able to do their activities. Other people saw it as a clear case of corruption and trying to um, siphon off some of the resources uh, from the state. Nigeria is an area that has a lot of um, oil production and oil wealth, and there's been a lot of studies seeing how not all that money goes uh, into um, the operating of the government. Um, this also is uh, the cash that was on the top of the Waddle page uh, for this week. That's the source of this. And so you can think of this as a case of uh, horizontal inequality if the people in government, uh, in government were of a particular ethnic, linguistic, or religious group um, or identifiable group. Or it could be a case of vertical, vertical inequality in which the group membership of those people, uh, the head of the in, um, intelligence agency, wasn't really relevant. It was just the fact that there was this large inequality between the haves and the have-nots uh, in that country. So it depends on what you know about the case and how you're going to theorize about what's actually going on. So there's a lot of different kind of um, um, inequality. Um, Buhaug focuses on um, the, the, the absolute uh, and, and focusing on the, the derivations uh, from average income. I think they were quite influential for trying to move the study of economic capacity at a subnational level. 
um, kind of like how Miguel et al. were cutting edge at trying to, uh, to understand and model um, the reciprocal relationship between economic growth and conflict or deal with uh, omitted variables that could be important. Um, there, Buhaug et al. are, of course, are not without their weaknesses. Um, a couple of uh, major ones that cropped out to me. One is that they use a cross-sectional uh, model like Collier and Hoffler did in which you have a snapshot across um, space but not across time. Uh, and so it might miss the, how those derivations from average income changes over time. You could see the recent example of um, Venezuela's economic collapse. Um, if you were writing a study about inequality in Venezuela now, you would tell a much different story than if you were writing about it 15 years ago, for example. Second, um, they didn't use all cells of uh, no conflict because conflict was such a rare occurrence when you disaggregate like this um, subnationally they chose a random selection of um, areas uh, with no conflict and so you have to take it on faith that a lot of that the cases that they chose of no conflict were not systematically different than the ones that they didn't include right that would be an additional robustness check to see if the robustness uh, the results changed also, um, unlike the uh, Miguel et al. piece in which they talk about the substantive effect as temperature rises, um, um, uh, or the, the Schultz, sorry, uh, article that as temperature rises, the chance of conflict changes, focusing on the substantive effect really understands how big the effect is. Um, Buhaug et al. is more focused on statistical significance and less on that kind of substantive significance. So we don't know how the likelihood of conflict changes as inequality changes. Um, so that's less clear about how much policy implications would have an effect on the bottom line if the difference is quite small or potentially quite large. A couple of um, broader connections between this article and the other ones that we read for today that I want to recognize and that gives us grist for discussion in the workshop is that all three focus on a rational approach, kind of understanding of conflict, in which you have people, groups, or individuals um, having an implicit or explicit cost-benefit analysis about the whether it's worth it to participate in violence. They're more focused on the research design contributions that they're making, omitted variable bias, um, endogeneity, subnational analyses, uh, or uh, instrumental uh, variables and less in uh, Collar and Hoffler just on the kind of um, the cost-benefit analysis that they focus less on theory um, and especially with the Collier and Hoffler example their measurements are less than exact they have um, variables in uh, uh, like GDP having a couple or population having a couple of different effects depending on what you're actually looking at um, I'm sure I'm missing others I think in the workshop it would be interesting to get your perspective about what the um, weaknesses are of this and by looking at them in conjunction I think once one of the most important things I'm trying to get you to do is to kind of say this is a large literature here's what one is pointing out and here's what another one does right so the Barnett and Adger piece is adding environment into the understanding of the causes of conflict and that's completely absent basically from the from the Blatman and Miguel piece right so each one of this one of these works that we're gonna see is t uh, is providing a piece to the puzzle but I want you to be able to start to see the overall uh, puzzle start to take shape as we um, come back to these same kind of themes over and over again um, and I think Focusing on methods is something that is easy to do um, for the people who are using these kind of methods and can um, and you, you start to feel like you're applying it to a whole bunch of different cases in which it might not necessarily be uh, the best uh, for it. 